So good morning, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. How close I, should I put this? Yeah. Good morning, everyone. I'm happy to see uh, so many of you here this early in the morning, and uh, also so many of you online. My name is Päivi Honkatukia, and I'm chairing this session. Uh, I work at, as a professor of youth research at Tampere University and currently act as, as a chair of the Finnish Youth Research Society. And it's my great pleasure today uh, uh, to act as a chair of this second session of this conference. Uh, and I wish you all welcome. Uh, today, we are very pleased to have uh, Associate Professor of Sociology, Stephen Threadgold, as our guest speaker. Uh, he works currently at the University of Newcastle, Australia. Uh, he's also a co-director of the Newcastle Youth Studies Network and a member of an editorial board of youth studies and, and, uh, and sociology journals. Uh, his research focuses on youth and class, and he's particularly interested in unequal and uh, alternative work career trajectories, underground and independent creative scenes and cultural formations of taste. Uh, his latest book is called Bourdieu and Effect Towards a Theory of Effective Affinities, and it's published by Crystal University Press. And it should also be mentioned uh, that his earlier book, Youth, Class, and Everyday Struggles, won the uh, 2020 Raven Connell Prize for the best first book in Australian sociology. Uh, Stephen's ongoing uh, research projects are very interesting too, and they concern, for example, online cultural taste communities, immaterial forms of labor uh, young people perform to create value in the nighttime economy and young people's relation to work well-being and debt, all relevant themes for many of us too. Today, Steve's talk is titled effective affinities and the everyday lives of young people. I believe we are all eager to hear about your insights. Uh, and then Steve's talk will be commented by Academy Research Fellow Lotta Heikola. She's a sociologist who currently works at, at the Finnish Youth Research Network. She has studied extensively youth services, activation and youth policies, issues related to migration and the second generation, as well as uh, the governance of youth unemployment. Her current research projects concerns logistics in warehouses and distribution. Uh, and uh, her approach is, is ethnographic. That means that she participates in the activities and everyday lives of, of the research subjects. I wish you both welcome to speakers to this session. And this event proceeds so that we first hear Steve's talk and thereafter let Lotta's comments, after which uh, I believe we have plenty of time for, for the general discussion. I'll now give floor to Steve, please. We are pleased to have you here and the floor is yours. Oh, hi, um, thanks for having me. Um, it's currently six o'clock at night in Australia here, so it's, um, I really wish I could be over there with you guys. Um, so um, yeah, um, what I'm gonna do is today, I'll just share my screen.
Is that working? Yes. Excellent. It's fine. Okay, thanks. Okay, so um, yeah, today, thanks thanks so much for the invite. I really um, am honored and really appreciate uh, being here to talk to your, your um, research network today. Um, so what I, what I plan to do today is to talk about class and to talk about it from a number of different aspects. Um, and what I'm, what I'm gonna do though is base it on these research projects um, that um, I've been doing, some which are complete and some which are ongoing. So, uh, and I, here I want to kind of do this as well to acknowledge the colleagues that I work with, uh, mostly in a, in a, in a really um, excellent research team. So there's one project that I'm gonna talk about, which is, uh, happened last year really quickly when COVID happened and the hospitality industry was instantly shut down. Um, we were meant to have, a, have an event with a small amount of money. Um, obviously you couldn't have events anymore. So we changed it into a research project where we interviewed some um, hospital workers in Newcastle and in Melbourne. Um, and we um, asked them to kind of keep a diary and stuff as well. Another, and, that, and that's with um, Julia, Co Julia Coffey, David Frugia and Penny Jane Burke. The second research project is Struggles and Strategies in Higher Education, very much influenced by the Paired Peers Project in the UK. And that was done, funded by the Centre of Excellence and Equity in Higher Education at my university with Matt Bunn and Penny Jane Burke. The third project I'm going to be drawing upon is an ongoing project funded by my faculty, um, Regional Youth in Precarious Times, Work, Wellbeing and Debt. Um, that's with my colleagues, David Ferruja, Julia Cook, Kate Senior, Julia Coffey, Kate Davies, Adriana Harrow and Barry Shannon. And in that project, we're interested in young people's experience of debt, a fairly ubiquitous experience for debt today, um, and getting them to reflect on how that um, affects the way that they kind of see the world, see the future and, and things like that. The third, the, sorry, the fourth one is a, a large research project funded by our ARC here, the Australian Research Council, with David Frugia, Julia Coffey, Lisa Atkins, Rose Gill and Megan Sharp. And in that project, we're um, doing some work. Uh, we've done a lot, lot of interviews at the moment uh, with young people that work in the nighttime economy in bars and clubs and pubs. And what we're interested in is a way that the very presence of young people um, create value. I'm um, particularly interested in the way that kind of different taste cultures, the way that gender and sexuality is enacted in those spaces um, and the way that these things provide value um, for the economy. And I'll go into the kind of class aspects of that. The last one is some media analysis work on the hipster and bogan that I've been doing um, for a number of years. I've kind of stopped working on it now because um, I kind of became almost haunted by the hipster and bogan. They were everywhere I looked. Um, and I'll talk about that towards the end. So they're the kind of research projects that I'm drawing upon. Um, and also I'm, I'm not gonna talk about conceptual theory too much in this um, talk, but I'm gonna um, briefly introduce my ideas of figures of youth and some you know, very quickly touch upon some of the aspects of the book or Geron Effect to think about the data that I'm going to talk about throughout the most of the talk. And I'm going to kind of bring it all together at the end and kind of tenuously connect the figures work and the and the stuff about Borger and Effect. So that's the plan. Okay, so just very quickly in terms of figures of youth, um, what, what I've been interested in that work is Kind of the realization really that when we talk about young people we're often seem to be talking about different things talking past each other have different perceptions of what that is now this is obviously the case between youth studies researchers that delve into young people's lives and work with them and certainly with the way that people like politicians and the media represent young people they seem to be very different things but um i also think that in youth studies sometimes we're talking about different things when we're talking about young people so there's the notion of youth, a more conceptual idea, the kind of, you know, the age bracket, the transition period, the kind of concept. And certainly in some of the stuff I'm talking later on in the, in the talk, that are bound up with ideas of immaterial labour. And there's the young person, the kind of actual living, breathing human. So there's already a kind of slide between those terms quite a lot, I think, in our work. Um, so I think if we start thinking a little bit figuratively about the version of the young person we're using in our work or the young person version of that that we're analysing, this can kind of help us, I think, have a more coherent understanding of young people's lives. So thinking with figures um, shows us how the very idea of youth is brought into being, certainly shows us how young people are governed and exploited and disciplined 
you know, very much in that kind of moral panic um, and governmentality sense. And I think it also helps us as individual researchers understand the position of young people in our research. Now, the aspects of class I'm going to talk about throughout this paper kind of trouble, the, trouble these figures in a way, and I'll, I'll come back to that at the end. So in that paper, I sketch out a bunch of figures. So if you're interested in that, um, please check those out. Um, but I certainly don't think this is all the figures of young people. I very much invite um, more of this kind of thing. I think it's really valuable work to think about how youth are positioned um, in the social world, but also in the social sciences. In terms of my work on Borgia and effect, again, I'll just very quickly touch on this. Um, I'm very much a Borgesian interested scholar. Um, I would say methodologically as much these days as, as theoretically. And I'm also very much interested in effect and emotions. So um, I've always been kind of somewhat dissatisfied about, you know, the way that effect and emotion was kind of treated or not treated really in Bourdieu's work. So I kind of bring effect, uh, versions of effect to Bourdieu to kind of flesh out that kind of symbolic aspect that um, often seems to work as kind of a black box to me. I've also been a little bit frustrated by some of the effect theories over the years that kind of, um, I really like this quote that I kind of often use to explain this, that scientists can detect it, philosophers can imagine it, but social sciences, scientists and cultural critics can't interpret it. It's kind of, the effect is often positioned as kind of excessive or more than representational or non-representational. Observationally, I think that much of the kind of effective relations that we kind of analyze and can see happen in hierarchies and specific institutions. And I think, you know, very much can be interpreted. So I think bringing effect and Bourdieu together is kind of useful for doing that. So I sketch out this idea of effective affinities, kind of a play on words of Bourdieu's, you know, complicated language of structuring structures and stuff like that as a, as a kind of concept for considering the looming nature of class in everyday life how class kind of haunts social spaces and the way that kind of affects the way that we're attached to things, the way that we leave impressions or are impressed upon, the way that we feel things in intense manners or not. I think a very easy way to, you know, to put effect in a Borgesian sense is when we think about distinction, the things we love, the things we hate, you often feel this before you know it, you know, in a social situation. So, I think this is a kind of nice way of bringing these, these, ways to get, these things together. So I kind of sketch out some of Bourdieu's concepts. Again, I won't go into those in too much detail, but I bring a kind of effective element to what's usually left as a symbolic or phenomenological. We talk about habitus as kind of one's history rolled up into an effective ball of human dispositions. Um, Illusio, I think, is a particularly underrated concept, um, underused concept, helped us understand how we invest ourselves in things or not how we connected or attached to some things over others, how we um, experience the gravity of some things over others. I think most obviously the idea of symbolic violence, I think is the Borgesian concept that can use a kind of effective element. And I, and I kind of start thinking about symbolic violence as an effective violence. And I'll kind of talk about that throughout the, the talk. So here, you know, these kind of relations deliver emotional cuts and bruises to people and these mark you know, mark our dispositions, one's kind of imminent wellspring of dispositions as one moves through social space and is socialized from an early age. So I think this kind of way of thinking about Bourdieu and the way this way of thinking about effect helps kind of flesh out some of the emotional aspects of day-to-day -day life, and particularly how class inequalities work in the moment. Um, and, you know, that kind of famous Borgesian idea of that's not for the likes of us, you know, being refused for what one's already refused, I think it's particularly good for that. In terms of the conference theme about turning points, and I, I watched um, Andrew Phoenix's um, excellent uh, talk last night, I think turning points are a really important way of thinking about moments in people's lives. But I also, in this talk, want to emphasize a little bit about the mundane kind of everyday lifeness that I think we need to um, bring out. So something, times that think, sometimes I think things that look like turning points, crises, moments of change, can actually be kind of the expression of underlying class relations that have maybe been bubbling along for the person for a long time. Okay, so in the following empirical examples, what I plan to do is um, I'll kind of zip around between material, symbolic and effective examples of class. I'm particularly interested in qualitative aspects. I'm certainly not downplaying quantitative research at all here. It's heaps valuable, um, but I'm more interested in kind of qualitative and subjective 
kind of relation. So that's what I'm going to be kind of talking about. In, throughout the examples, there'll be, you know, um, illustrations of how class intersects with gender and ethnicity, location, mobility. Um, so um, again, not downplaying any of those other kind of contours in equality, but I'm going to mostly focus upon drawing out class examples. And what I want to show in the talk is that basically it's in between the everyday situations and moments in young people's lives, the kind of the things they experience, particularly when they kind of experience what I call effective violence. So there's that. There's also more broadly the figurative of representations of young people in day-to-day -day life in the media and politicians and by experts and by youth researchers. And it's, you know, somewhere in that space is where kind of there's a, a constant kind of clash, I think, between um, the way young people are in the world, the way they kind of feel, the way they're, ex what their expectations are. And it's in those moments where class emerges between kind of affinities with things and through um, relations of effective violence. So the figure I use in a research is kind of this figure of struggle. An accumulated being is practicing reasonably, not rationally, importantly there, um, and in good faith. I really tend to kind of um, argue against notions of the cultural dupe and things like that when it comes to young people. Okay, so let's get into the empirical examples. I'm going to firstly touch upon the work we did with young hospitality workers who instantly lost their work in the COVID shutdown in 2020. What I'm going to do is talk about Rosie. Um, Rosie was one of the 32 hospitality workers that we spoke to. And we also asked them to keep photo, photo journals of their time in lockdown, not working in May and June 2020. Um, we also were lucky enough to be able to kind of get some money to get, give our participants $50 supermarket vouchers, which is at the time was um, really important for them. So Rosie came from Spain to Australia on a working holiday. But she liked the country and she decided to try and become an international student here, which she did. And then she got the right visas and was, you know, uh, studying, I think, a master's. At the time, she had three jobs. COVID happens, she loses all the work. Now, important background information here is that, like all international students, um, Rosie had zero access to any governmental financial support. So in Australia, the higher education, um, uh, system and international students is constantly boasted by our government of being like the third biggest export industry in the country. But when COVID happened, they were essentially abandoned by the government. Um, zero access, so they all of a sudden had to support for themselves. Some of the other examples um, from this cohort, we had, you know, students from Sri Lanka, like lining up for food and, um, you know, going on Facebook to find social Sri Lankan communities to try and help them out at the time. There was absolutely no support for them at all. So she moved out of a house, you know, to get in some cheaper residence. She actually spent all her superannuation money that she kind of built up in her three jobs. So she should, certainly wasn't passive, you know, she was really trying to support herself. Following the loss of all this income, Rosie decided it was time to turn a book home. And this comes after a fairly pointed comment from our prime minister. So she books a flight to go home. She's trying to get home, but, you know, the airline industry is in chaos. Um, she can't get a flight, she books a flight, it gets cancelled, she can't get her money back. So, you know, even trying to get out of the country has seen her become even more impoverished. At the time in the media, our Prime Minister was asked, you know, what are you going to do for international students? And he basically told them that they can go home. But actually, this was actually physically impossible for many of them as well. So when specifically asked about this, um, Rosie says, because of the pand pandemic, I lost all my work. The Prime Minister says, go home, and I don't have any help here. I say, why do I want to stay in a country where I'm not worth it? They don't want me. My family wants me. So Rosie tries to get home. She tries to get some support from her parents, but the pandemic's happening in Spain as well, and they've got no work and struggling um, with money as well. So she goes to the internet, to various job sites to find, try and find work, really struggles to find work, goes to Gumtree, which is kind of Australia's versions of, of Craigslist, if you're familiar with that from American pop culture. Online classifieds. This guy rings her back, gives her a cleaning job. So as she says here, and it's really important to consider here, like Rosie's expression when she's telling us about this is really visceral. Like she's, you know, quite upset and, um, and that kind of angry about what happened here. So she gets this job, this weird dude comes, you know, tells her that um, she can, uh, he'll send an Uber to come and pick her up to do these cleaning jobs. Rosie lives in the middle of Melbourne. 
and she's asked to go, you know, you know, 40 minutes out of the out of Melbourne, out to the outer suburbs. She gets a bad vibe about this um, and says to her friend, look, I'm going to this address to do this job, but I don't tell you anything in 15 minutes, call the police. Instantly, Rosie here, you know, is feeling risk. She's in a precarious position. So what's happening here is that Rosie's class position, in a sense of being an international student, um, her precarity is kind of doubled down by being, you know, a woman in the world that has to, you know, go out and face these kind of risks with men every day. So this man picks her up, you know, she says, starts, what's interesting about this next quote is she kind of talks about the experience while it was happening, but then reflecting on it, why she's doing it. You know, she's got to go so far away, but she has nothing in her life. She doesn't have a job. I have to work. Um, then she gets picked up. It's a filthy car full of McDonald's. He doesn't even move the garbage for her. There's shit everywhere. The car stinks. Um, the guy is basically in, you know, ill-fitting clothing with, his, with no underwear. He's fat. He's missing teeth. So she's starting to get real kind of disgust by serial experience here. Um, she goes to the house. She's cleaning, um, you know, and she's saying to herself, what are you doing? You've finished your degree. You know four languages and you're cleaning this. Uh, you're cleaning with this fucking weirdo. It was so bad, you know, maybe I'm a little bit of a princess, but no, no, no. So again, um, this is a kind of very much a viceroyal experience for Rosie. Then the guy starts creeping onto her. We're cleaning walls and he's like, let's do it together. So she starts to get um, even more worried. Then she starts to get a sore hand from the chemicals she was using. The other girl that's working there said, oh, sorry, you know, I should have told you that this stuff's toxic. Don't get it on your skin. Um, so she wants out. The guy agrees, takes her to the train station, pays her. But then that, later that night, she starts getting creepy um, text messages from this dude, texting me at 12.30. A man with a family, you know, no way. So the only option she had was to stop working there. At this point, I think we need to think about what's Rosie's class relation here. You know, she's kind of become in some way a disgusted subject downward towards this guy who's giving her the employment. So the, the class relations here in terms of a more global sense become um, interesting to think about, I think. So Rosie wasn't be able, able to find any work. And what ended up happening with Rosie is when she actually rang in for the interview that we'd organised with her, she was actually sitting in a clinical paid drug trial. Um, she was getting blood taking, spending some time there. Basically, she said, um, it's good money. I have to study, so why not just go to this place, you know, give blood, get the drug tests and be able to study while she's there. They pay me by the hour and they give you food, feel a little bit more relaxed, less stress. I wasn't receiving any money just to be at home. So to conclude um, the example for Rosie here, firstly, in terms of a relation of symbolic violence, you know, Rosie's told to go home after being in the country for a couple of years. Um, you know, and this could be considered a kind of real turning point, I suppose, with how she thinks of the world, and thinks of her position in the world, sorry. Up until this point, you know, in terms of an example of youth transitions, Rosie's kind of made all the right choices. She's studied hard, she's working three jobs, she's building the cultural network capital needed in a kind of global network, in a global um, labor market. But, you know, instantly what happens in the pandemic is that Rosie's subject position shifted from being on the right path to like intense instantaneous precarity. But in a way, her class position has not really changed all that much. You know, after the pandemic finishes, she'll probably continue to study, you know, maybe get the get degree and go back on that path. But in this sense, she experiences intense precarity instantly. And essentially what this means is that, you know, someone doing all the right things coming to a racist country like Australia can, you know, be very quickly shot down the class system um, in a point of crisis like this. So she's experienced disconnect from her family, um, knowing that like her parents at home are struggling as well. Um, this creates kind of all kinds of ugly feelings um, for, for Rosie, and anger, envy, anxiety, paranoia, irritation. Okay, moving on to the second example. Um, this is um, some work I've, I've been doing with um, Matt and Penny in our own um, university, where we interviewed students in the Bachelor of Social Science and also in the Bachelor of Business and Law kind of using them as very loose proxies of class, knowing what their kind of background is in terms of who does those degrees, their parents' occupations, and their own experiences of what they tell us in the interviews. So this is influenced by the Paired, Paired Peers Project from the UK. Um, again, we interviewed 32 people here, 
16 in final years of study, nine who had recently graduated, and seven who had actually deferred or dropped out. Um, and the reason we are interviewing people at that stage is what we're inter interested in this project is the transition from higher education into the labour market. We know a lot about inequalities of getting into university, but there's much less um, um, particularly qualitative research about what happens on the way out. Um, so in this sense, we're looking at the university not as a kind of panacea for class inequalities, something to fix them, even though in Australia there's been widening participation and people from um, more diverse backgrounds do go to university now, but still how universities are kind of key makers and producers of class and produce class boundaries. So I'm interested in this project about um, what these young students um, are, how they're oriented towards their study, their experiences of high school and their transition into higher ed, the plans they're doing while they're studying to get a job, and in particular, the increased need to do things like internships, volunteer work, which um, you know, quite obviously um, favours those who are quite privileged and have material privilege and support to be able to do that kind of thing. So firstly, um, we have some examples here of, you know, at high school, the social science students that went to kind of relatively low funded public schools, often in the outer suburbs of Newcastle. Um, giving you some examples here of experience in what would be normally called symbolic violence, but what I like to call effective violence. So Lennon tells us about like this program at school that they had to do called put your hand, put your hand up, not your hand out, which is basically telling these kids, disadvantaged kids, you know, get a job and don't be on welfare. Um, Carrie tells us about how she watched students favour some, um, she, sorry, she watched teachers favour some students over others. Um, my opinion of it is that certain students in high school outshine other students, it just was told to those students, you're going to university. Other students that lack the straighter academics of it were kind of overlooked a little. That's how I feel. So um, Carrie tells us that she achieved quite, quite well academically, but because she kind of didn't wear the uniform and like, you know, mucked up a bit, she was often told by her teachers that she was never going to achieve anything. So these kind of experiences stick with the students as they kind of transition from high school into the kind of unfamiliar surrounds of higher education, because they're more often than not the first in their family to go to university. When they get to university, similar kind of structures exist. Um, and many of our students in the social science programs spoke about how people in other degrees were kind of, you know, denigrating them for doing that degree. You know, what's that for? What kind of job will that give you? It's a bit of a waste of time. So Daphne, for instance, felt that everybody um, doing other degrees looked down on her. So this is, those were experiences of effective, um, effective violence. Here we can see more kind of effective affinities, kind of more privileged positions in upper higher education. Um, and so you have Lucy here telling us, you know, that after school, she considered having a gap year, but she always knew where she would end up. You know, here university is just a natural progression for, in her life. And I think that's maybe a mix of family values and also just who I am. Now, there you have the kind of classic bait and switch that, you know, privileged middle-class people do that, Rather than talk about their privilege, you know, they talk about their values. Um, there was always the expectation to go to university, like it wasn't under pressure or anything, you know, but I fitted in, I fit into that expectation. I wanted to do it, my parents did as well. Catalina, in another example of effective affinity, talks here about the material support that she had from her parents. She doesn't have to work full time. Um, they put her through university for four years, you know, she got to live at home, she got to go to Europe twice. You know, living at home has probably been the easiest, the best thing throughout studying. You know, when you've got to study for exams, you don't have to cook dinner and all things like that. Um, so again, these are examples I think about the way that material conditions um, can allow a kind of effective freedom for these more privileged kids to be able to invest themselves into the study. And in particular, invest themselves into um, the extracurricular activities that are needed more and more in higher education now. So we were asking a lot about like what internships and volunteering and extracurricular stuff would um, people were doing. And this is increasingly around the kind of discourse of employability. Um, and so you have here that Beatrice, um, a business student talking about, you know, applying for jobs. And they're always asking, you know, what extra things are you doing? So she's doing international leadership volunteering because it's always good to help out the community. Again here, again, I think what's a classic 
um, form of kind of saying one thing and kind of bracketing out another. You know, she's very much helping herself by doing these things, but you can kind of, you know, renegotiate that as being good for the community. These things give her opportunities to do the extra little things. Um, we have Ernie here, they're very much concentrated on his academic record in the first couple of years of uni. And then, you know, once he felt he'd built up, built up the good academic transcript, he's now fully investing himself in the more extracurricular stuff. So there's kind of a social magic that happens here. The young people with privileged backgrounds, you know, have more time, have more space. They know the right people, they go to the right places to be able to get these, the right internships, the right um, volunteer places. But for someone from a more disadvantaged background, a working class background that doesn't really kind of come into higher education expecting to have to do all that extra stuff, there's a kind of social distance, a more kind of um, effective, um, effective violence when it comes to these things. A surprise that like, surely you just come to university and study and you get your degree and you get your job. So here we have Daphne telling us kind of how there was an opportunity to go and do this work placement that, that she didn't really see or understand that it was something that she needed to do. It was positioned as an elective in her degree. Um, so, you know, I'm not gonna put all that time and effort into doing it because I would assume she would have to organize a contact person, set it all up. I kind of assumed that this would be a little bit more than just me figuring it out. And I didn't really know where to go with that. She just also talks about how there was little information um, in the course to kind of help her understand why that would be a good thing to do. So Daphne also has, you know, to work, you know, three or four days a week to, while she studies. Um, taking on these extra free forms of labour is much more difficult for a student like that. So to conclude this example, there's no real surprises here. This kind of, you know, in very much parrots a bunch of, you know, previous higher education literature. Low SES students struggle more in higher education than those from more privileged backgrounds. This has nothing to do with meritocracy. You know, these kids are just as smart, they work just as hard. In some cases, really, they're working doubly hard because they're actually having to have real jobs while they study. Um, and, and they're not really just full-time students in that sense. Or they live a long way from campus and have to get to campus, which is quite difficult in a place like Newcastle with poor public transport. They're performing care roles and stuff like that. The more privileged have an affinity with the unsaid workings of the labour market trajectories. As I said, they go to the right places, know the right people, have the material support to do the free labour. So a turning point for some of these disadvantaged kids is when they get to university, um, when their expectations are thwarted by the reality. And this very much speaks into the work around the kind of over the past 10 years, how the degree itself was not enough. So in many ways, the new kind of terrain of higher education where it's not just about degree, it's about, you know, doing internships and making connections. For many disadvantaged students, I would argue this kind of trajectory, these new demands sets them up to fail. Okay, I'll move on to example three. This is from our project on young people and debt. Um, in, this, in this research, we were initially trying to uh, talk to try and talk to disadvantaged people who were taking advantage of payday loans. This proved to be really hard to recruit for, but what we were getting people coming out to want to talk to us was about um, more the usage of things like buy now, pay later products like Afterpay and, and zip pay and things like that. So um, again, another, another anomaly in this research so far is it seems that young women are much more enthusiastic or wanting to talk about debt than, than young men. Um, we imagine that this has to do with, you know, masculinity, femininity, managing money and stuff like that in various relationships, but also how that pertains to, you know, notions of guilt and shame that are very much tied up in the moral economy of debt. So at the same time as kind of labour's changed and there's more and more immaterial labour and free labour going on in um, the young people's um, transitions, um, it's almost ubiquitous now that young people need to go into debt in one form or another in Australia. So debt has become pretty much taken for granted in this kind of youth transitional experience. And in our research, we find that there's different kind of categories of debt made by our young people. There's good debts, such as higher education, fees, or a mortgage to buy a house, which is kind of seen as an investment in one's future. Or there's bad debts, which is like credit cards, buy now, pay later services, that tend to be associated with consumer desires that, you know, promote forms of guilt and stuff like that when people are doing them. But really, you know, being a young person, you want to enjoy yourself, you want to have the things, you want to, you know, do the, go to the concerts, 
you know, have some travel. So this allows that to happen. Even privileged kids go into um, debt. So, you know, they have what's increasingly called the bank of mum and dad. So debt is largely ubiquitous. And so we're interested in how that kind of orients young people towards the future. So in this example, I'm gonna talk about Anna. Um, Anna lives in a kind of country town about an hour and a half out of Newcastle inland. Um, it's basically got no public transport. So you can see cars become important in this. So, you know, if you wanna work, if you have a job and you live in one town and you work in another town half an hour later on, there's no public transport to get there. So um, cars are essential. So, you know, from a really young age, Anna got herself into trouble. Um, at 15, she got a credit card, um, got into debt on that. Um, at the moment, she's a young mom in her late 20s. She has three kids under six. And at the moment, after working a bunch of different hospitality jobs, she traveled overseas, um, worked in supermarkets. She even, I think, worked at um, an Olympic game somewhere. She doesn't miss this kind of work and she's decided she wants to become a nurse. And she's trying to, smack, what she says, smash through her nursing degree. Anna's husband is an uh, arborist and truck driver, but he's really precariously employed as well. So, you know, they're young, they have kids, they would love to buy a house, which is, you know, the great Australian dream. But as she said in the early part of her interview, she's had to put that on the back burner for a while. As the interview unfolds, though, we realise that this is because of the current debt situation as much as anything else. She talks about having really bad role models as a parent towards using money. Her parents were always in debt, um, and she sees it as she sees it now. She comes to realise as she gets older, they were living week to week, and you know, saw debt as always tomorrow's problems. So when she got together with her husband, she says he was in zero dollars debt, but combined now we're in seventy thousand dollars debt since we've been together. Of course, I've kind of raised myself apart from help from my nan since I was sixteen years old. I didn't have any parents to kind of help, so I guess getting into debt was something I needed to do to get to the places that I have. So her debt, that's $70,000 is made up of credit cards, car loans, and more recently buy now pay later services. So it started in high school. She, you know, got sent a letter at home or something, you know, where you can, at the time you could get a credit card fairly easily. She blew that pretty quick, buying the meaningless things you would expect of a, you know, a young girl at, at high school, uh, consumer products. She got into trouble. She started to feel sick in the stomach about this and you know she now sees those purchases as sad as she says hindsight is a crazy thing so those debts kind of mount as she gets older she comes up with various strategies to pay them off um, she used some money that she left her in a trust um, but then you know you know she comes a fam gets a family she needs to get a car they get a car loan but then it's made redundant so the car gets repossessed they still owe money on the excess things are kind of mounting up here but as she's point, kind of pointed out, being in debt was kind of normal for her. It was a constant state of appearance. And she, she doesn't at the time while this is happening, feel that bad about it or feel like she's getting into any real trouble. So she comes home with some strategies to clear some of the debt. She gets some of that happening, but then she has to move out of a rental property, has to get the bond for that, which is, you know, thousands of dollars. So she gets a credit card to do that as well. She cuts up the credit cards. She stops kind of using those things, but then buy now, pay later services come along. She didn't really realize at first that these things put you in debt. She felt it was more like a lay by that you're using your own money and you just kind of pay it off later on. So she signs up to Afterpay, but then she realizes you can get a bunch of these platforms going at once. She had one in a maiden name, one in her own name. And, you know, all of a sudden she starts digging a bit of a hole for herself there. She needs stuff for the baby. So she starts getting um, some other uh, buy now, pay later service as well. She has after pay, zip pay, zip money. Makes it easier to buy those things. Um, and then, you know, you need stuff to kind of move in with your husband after you get married. So the debts mount and, you know, she's had to shut down those services as well. She started to kind of learn about finances a lot more now in the mid twenties. She's been listening to kind of financial advice podcasts and she now feels more confident. She's kind of doing something about that debt. She feels a bit silly about all this. But, you know, she finds now that like reflecting on it, she feels like she's been exploited by this. She was never really taught financial literacy um, at school. She was never had an example of it from a parent. So she says, you know, it's really scary for a kid. She's really trying hard to ch uh, change her financial situation and our money story to help them with their money story. She wants to become a good example so the kids don't reproduce the mistakes she's made. 
When asked about her own future, being in debt kind of puts a lot of things on hold. She needs to finish uni, to buy a house. She needs to save to get a deposit, but really, you know, paying off this debt is going to take years to be able to do that. Money's pretty tight, so I guess it's all just delayed. So the future feels delayed at this point, you know, sense that because she's in so much debt. She's a little bit optimistic, though, you know. She thinks she'll get there in the end. We know what it takes. We know what we want to do. We just have to keep at it. So to conclude here for, for Anna's story, um, Anna has an effective affinity with debt. It formulated a habit as it was just a normal part of her upbringing. I won't go into the automated design and the gamification of these apps too much, but we're doing work around that as well to kind of talk about how um, these new buy now, pay later apps very much appeal to young people because they, um, you know, are very much an affinity with how young people live their lives online and the gamification aspects in particular um, are, are part of that. So the gamification literature talks about, you know, trying to kind of transform homo economicus into homo ludens, you know, a gaming kind of subjectivity. But I don't think these kind of things are duping young people. Our young people are kind of reflexively aware about the good and bad aspects of debt generally, but debt becomes a necessity in this sense to be able to kind of live a good life in that uh, Laurent Ballant center sense, I think. Um, as, you know, youth labor markets are precarious, and, um, you know, casualization and stuff like that to be able to kind of get by unless you're quite privileged is difficult. So debt has rendered an inevitable occurrence. The needs to be negotiated for having an acceptable life in the present and to be able to plan towards a future good life. And just in passing here, I'm playing around with kind of a theoretical idea of a new kind of ugly feeling um, influenced by Sian Nagai about what I'll call in-debt pending, a kind of, you know, play between the way that, you know, future depends on being in debt means that the kind of future is pending and the way this kind of leads to different notions of independence. Okay, the fourth example I'm going to talk about is the work we've been doing in the nighttime economy in bar work about um, the way that young people's very presence in those scenes um, creates value that they're not paid for and often exploited for. So this, so far we've interviewed 75 hospitality workers and we hope to do the ethnography soon. Obviously COVID has um, shut that down at the moment, but we're hoping to even start that next month and do that into the next year. In terms of the class, one, the way that kind of the class needs to be thought about here, it's in terms of kind of positionality and performativity rather than like a static position. The, the young workers in these bars aren't necessarily from a particular class, but they're working in a particular area and in a particular scene that's kind of a creative scene, um, you know, has kind of music scenes and art stuff going on. It's a very kind of middle, upper class, sorry, upper cultural capital kind of scene. And as I'll talk to in a, in a minute, it's kind of gentrifying as well. But people come from different backgrounds here, but what happens in this space is I think interesting the way the class is produced. So the jobs that they get is mainly done through word of mouth. And it's often done by being part of the scene already. So in the, in the kind of um, North Melbourne that we're talking about here, very much kind of what used to be called a hipster suburb in, in ways, but people um, get their jobs because they look the part, you know, they like the right bands, they have probably been coming to the pub to see bands. So they have the right subcultural social capital. It's very rarely interviews, you know, it's kind of, you need to pa pass what they call the sniff test. So many of the bar workers are doing these jobs to support themselves to something else, but many end up staying in it for a while, what they call lifers. But there's many different kind of illusio to do this work, financial imperatives, creating a good vibe. There's also a political aspect to this working in this area. It's a very leftist progressive place. There's LGBTI nights, non-gendered bathrooms, art music scene. So there's like a, a leisure aspect of working in these places as well. So in these places, there's strong affinities between what we call the punter and the worker. But there's all kinds of forces of gentrification going in the north where kind of what was previously a relatively uh, poverty stricken areas being gentrified. So Carly here talks about how, you know, certain types of people are being squeezed out by pricing of drinks, economically freezing people out. Um, she feels gross about this. Um, she knows that she's part of that. She's not in denial of that. But this makes her feel uncomfortable. You know, she doesn't want to see people having to come here. And, but, but she doesn't think people should come there to expect cheap or free um, stuff. What's interesting about the class relations here is it's a more as much a political as an economic or material relation. So the, the language of class comes out, particularly when these bar workers are talking about people they perceive above them in class, like with more money in particular, 
people that act like what they call dickheads in there, people that are kind of sexist and racist and, and things like that. So the directionality of this kind of way that they talk about other people, people are often positioned as having less class, even though they have more money. And again, this becomes about affinities here. The people working in these places in the particular pub or bar often refer to it as their lounge room or the place they can be themselves. And when people don't fit in, even if they are more privileged or rich, they have kind of fairly status, um, uh, status insults to say about them. And as Greg says here, we're talking about the Chrysler band of, brand of dickhead as opposed to a Datsun brand of dickhead. And they're two car brands. But what we find here is bar workers are phenomenologists. They, um, they have to kind of deal with people on this effective level. They talk about being able to see an alcoholic a mile off, you know, when someone walks in very passive and at ease, shoulders back and swaggering, you know, or hunched over and furtive, aggressive or defensive body language, they start to kind of read the room. And this is particularly the case for women in these scenes when it comes to things like sexual harassment. And we've got a, a paper led by Julia Coppi that's about that out of this research. So they kind of have to scan, you know, always looking for problems in a bar because as people get drunk, you know, they get problematic, they become violent. So there's an effectivity going on here again in terms of how people relate to each other. It's done through symbolic notions of the way people hold themselves, body language, what they wear. Um, but these are very much markers of class as well. And for the young people working in these bars, they reflexively kind of know what they're doing in a way. There's a pragmatism, ambivalence going on here, but they also have a sense of disgust and guilt about what they're doing here. They're what I've called in other work, reflexively complicit with these class relations, even though they kind of don't like it themselves. So what's happening in these spaces? Useful subjectivities, edgy, it's cool, kind of getting mined and co-opted. There's all kinds of different new forms of labor going on. The boundaries between work and leisure, labor and play are blurred. Um, yeah, as I said, young bar workers are reflexively complicit in these relations. And class kind of emerges in these everyday kind of um, moments and confrontations of who can come in, who can get served, who's becoming a problem. And these range from kind of mundane kind of notions of taste through to sometimes physically violent confrontations in bars. Okay, the last example I wanna talk about, I'm just gonna go through this one quite quickly, um, is the media analysis I've done about class figures in Australia, the hipster and the bogan. Um, I'm told there may be not be a real equivalent of bogan in Finland, maybe uh, junti, um, maybe that can come up in the questions. Um, so this, this work looked at uh, media representations and the way that the figure of the bogan and hipster was invoked in uh, news items, in opinion pieces, and also in some comedy stuff that happens in Australia, television shows and some web, um, some web shows. So, you know, I think most people are familiar with the hipster. It's kind of a global middle-class figure. Um, tends to be kind of endowed with a sense of irony and the way that it's talked about is often quite playful. It's not really talked about in symbolically violent ways that much. The bogan more so, which is very much like the chav in the UK or the redneck in um, the US. It's not quite as harsh as the chav, it's a little bit more playful, but like, it's more like something that's spoken down to, it's a lower class figure. So both these figures um, allow people to form, perform distinctions while kind of, you know, eschewing the very notion of class. And the example I use all the time about this is I get called a hipster and bogan by different people in my life. Um, so here we can kind of see the, the, the floating signifier going on here. The, you know, people I play cricket with, when I tell them to go and see a band they've never heard of, may have, you know, five years ago called me a hipster. The people I see a band with, when I tell them I play cricket, are likely to call me a bogan. So, um, again, the, there's a floating nature going on here. In Borgesian terms, you know, these figures classify and they classify the classifier. You know, what one person hipster might be another person boga, bogan. What I find interesting about the hipster, though, is it kind of become this global figure. But it seems like the lower class figure in different countries, you know, becomes more specific. And that almost kind of is a homology with, you know, class uh, mobility itself. So, you know, there's some kind of, <clears throat> I think what we'd be familiar kind of hipster examples, but then there's kind of the more <clears throat> um, bogan examples down below, particularly kind of the use of the Australian flag in the kind of this jingoistic way. High vis working class workers and stuff like that. So there's a fuzzy relationship going on here, but what I'm interested in is the way the commentariat, you know, those who get to kind of write in the media, their relation with these things. 
Um, both terms are kind of used pejorative in a way, but what's at stake with these figures? Well, I suppose when it comes to the hipster, many people working in the media very kind of have, have affinities with, you know, what's going on there. They'll have similar tastes. So the way that hipster is written about tends to be a little bit more reflexive, ironic. They're not so bad. The hipster mostly provoke debate about various issues. The bogan, not so much. Bogans aren't the one writing in the media. They, they tend to be more kind of aligned with hipster. So there's a social distance going on here between the bogan and those who are media producers. So there's much more symbolic and effective violence going on here. There's kind of class denigration, abjectification going on in representations of the, bo of the bogan. They're problematic as well, but they're not like the silly hipster. They're kind of vulgar, aggressive, disgusting kind of things. The bogan provokes complaint and morals, downward envy, fairness and disgust. Both in a way in that moral panic sense are a threat, but again, there's a playfulness around the hipster. With, well, but, you know, the hipster's often written around, around in terms of precarious labor, overloads of irony, um, the impossibility of originality or the kind of co-optation of, you know, identity politics or, you know, green sustainable businesses and stuff like that. The bogan tends to represent, you know, older lower class, you know, denigration of values and, and vulgarity and stuff like that. So the hipster and bogan in the media are used as kind of these markers of sense of one's place in social space. So they reinforce this sense of place in a couple of ways. Firstly, they are a sense of one's class place where social homologies, you know, affinities, things like that are reflexively marked and socially policed. When you call someone a hipster or a bogan, you can't, you're kind of invoking a class hierarchy here. Particularly with the hipster though, there's a kind of sense of one's generational place, I think as well, which I think is interesting for youth studies. Um, so they mark people's, particularly, you know, the more kind of boomer, baby boomer, people writing in the media, kind of their relation to what's cool and, and what's authentic and, take, and what's tasteful. So when you call someone a hipster or a bogan or a junti, it has very much to do with your own affinities, your own kind of class morals and tastes and values. Okay. And I'm getting to the end of my time, so I'll, I'll very quickly uh, sum up. So in terms of um, bringing this all together, <clears throat> in terms of turning points, well, you know, if you lose your job and can't feed yourself when a pandemic hits, the moment you realise university is not for the likes of me, I mean, the guilt and shame of being thousands of dollars in debt in a way that changes your orientation towards the future, the realisation that maybe, you know, despite hating gentrification, that you're a gentrifier or being called a, bogan, a hipster or a bogan. On the one hand, you know, at the individual level, we can think of these moments as kind of maybe points of self-reflection, as turning points, moments of crisis, moments to kind of reflect to try and make the right choices, these kind of things. So I think notions of turning points is useful in some sense in that way, but I think, Thinking about these empirical, you know, examples taken from young people's actually uh, everyday lives, I think they are as good, uh, better in expressions of, you know, how, how class is made and feels in everyday life. So while the Rosie's example, for instance, seems to kind of, you know, completely upend her life, her kind of imminent class position, I suppose, exposes her to that kind of sudden social change, uh, much more than, you know, if, she was, you know, a privileged white person living in Australia. So these moments summon class to the fore as feelings, emotions, instincts, reactions, that then, you know, people have to make choices, you know, to react to. And again, I'm quite kind of critical of the notion of choice in many ways in that sense. So I'm really interested here in the emotionality of class, how it's made and remade in everyday situations, how it's not necessarily experienced as a static material relation, but expressed in different emotional experiences, trajectories throughout different social spaces, institutions and scenes. And for me, this kind of way of thinking about everyday life and the affinities that we have and the way that our kind of many of the way that we feel in a current situation is the result of socialization in the past, troubles notions of choice and agency. And particularly in the education systems, I think you know, we need to pretty much get rid of the idea of meritocracy. And these have all been kind of concepts that are quite commonly used in youth studies. I mean, at the moment, what choices does Rosie really have? If you're first in family or university, which in and of itself getting to university feels like a great achievement, 
but all of a sudden discover that people, you know, take the piss out of your degree or it's not enough to get a job anyway, how are you actually meant to react? What choices do you then have? If Anna has an, if the example of Anna, you know, she's experienced that as being really normal. And now there's a variable industry trying to ex exploit, you know, people in precarious positions like her. What else can you expect than, you know, young people getting into debt? If you come from another place and move to Melbourne to be a part of a kind of creative artistic scene, um, you know, and that place is in a process of gentrification and then you move there and you're offended by it, but like you're part of it, you know, should you make a choice to leave? What actually can you do? And, you know, when it comes to the kind of figurative representations of class in the media, you know, uh, are you the hipster? Are you the bogan? Um, these effective relations for me um, also, I think, need to be considered about um, the way that the digital realm affects these things that I can't go into in too much more detail. But again, this relates to the figurative stuff that I was talking about earlier on, um, where, you know, algorithmic versions of class online um, are being kind of used to kind of make us click and, you know, all that kind of stuff as well. So I can't go into that in too much detail here, but I really highly recommend the predictive postcode book by uh, uh, Weber and, and Roger Burrows to, to think about that. Our affinities are very much, you know, something that are mined by things like Facebook and Twitter and TikTok. So to bring this kind of discussion back to the figures, and I'm going to conclude in a, in a sec with some ideas of what we can do in youth studies about this. Um, I've suggested that like thinking about figures and I use that kind of reasonable struggling um, figure in my research and inviting for more. I propose that tracing the ways that they're situated in these different ontological spaces, you know, at school, in the media, you know, online, um, as figures in popular culture, as, you know, young people working in bars. If we think about the different figurative ways that these things work, we can develop clearer conceptions of our research ob objects, help reduce confusion and the possibility that we're talking past each other, and very much, I think, engage and be reflexive about how sometimes youth studies is also a part of the governmentality process that Peter Kelly wrote about nearly 20 years ago now. In terms of class and figures, material and effective inequalities cloud these figures that I sketched out earlier on. This is particularly the case because the way that young people are represented in the media, you know, the relatively privileged just seem to be the ones that kind of dominate good representations. The materially disadvantaged always seem to be the ones that dominate the bad examples. So again, I think we need to kind of grapple with what class means with the way that young people are represented in the public. And finally, what can we do in terms of youth studies, I think it's really important. Um, and I, some may know that I've been involved in a, a debate about political economy and youth studies. And I think the political economy um, understanding and analysis of young people is hugely important. And you know, we need to think about the way that they use as figurative scapegoats, the way they're you know immaterially mined for profit, the way they pay big degrees to get you know, degrees that uh, big big money get degrees that don't really guarantee them a job or a decent wage, uh, decent wage. Um, and how they're kind of individually blamed when they get into difficulty. So youth in this sense are the actual young people, you know, the actual meat space young person here, but young people are also a bunch of figurative and effective elements of how capitalism metabolizes ever new frontiers to, as the famous saying goes, melt into air. So youth are materially exploited as ever, and their immaterial labor is essential to value creation in capitalism as, as well. And class is made, I think, in the relations between the kind of young person, um, you know, studying, working, um, consuming, and the figurative representations of them in the media and politics and things like that. So class is made in these everyday mundane practices and exchanges in education systems, hospital work, debt relations, and so forth, that reflect and reinforce structural material relations. But these things, these relations also work in ways that make it difficult to see class particularly where class is kind of denied much in public, particularly in Australia. And when things go wrong in a young person's life, the blame is always individualized. So for me, I think youth studies researchers, and this may already happen in Finland, I don't know, uh, need to take their sociological knowledge out into the public, more to challenge the dominant, uh, the dominant negative um, representations of them um, and challenge, I think, the economistic and psychological um, ways that young people are often figured in public. Thanks, I'll leave it there.
Thank you, Stephen, for this very rich and engaging talk. Um, and now we have Lotta's comments first, and then we, uh, we will have some discussion, I think. So please, Lotta. <laughs> okay. Um, Okay, hello everybody. I'm trying to say hi to Steve, but I don't know where to look. But anyway, <laughs> okay. Hi. <Bye>. So, <laughs> so um, thank you for the. I think I need to. Okay, thank you for the inspiring talk. Um, I'm trying to organize now my comment. It's kind of in two sections because I prepared something and then I have like more comments now now that I heard the actual talk. So, and the, for the last part, I also have a, like a PowerPoint, but I don't know how to, if I should put it up now or later, but anyway, so. Um, as like Baby introduced me in the beginning, thank you for the nice introduction. So I'm doing, currently doing ethnographic work on young people working in the logistics sector, but we have also the, uh, uh, done a sort of a similar project that one of Steve's projects about young people working in the hospitality sector, so restaurants and uh, cafes and fast food joints during COVID pandemic and also a colleague of mine has started kind of before COVID. So um, I've been working with this like young people in working life now I'm, I'm previously also doing research on the on like how young people are governed in 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 youth policies and and all uh, and activism policies for young people. So all these projects and and uh, uh, directed to maybe marginalized young people or young people outside education and work. So the, the sort of two different uh, fields, kind of with different uh, questions, maybe research questions, but still maybe coming together hopefully. But anyway, uh, in the, like in my first section, trying to comment on the on on, on the presentation uh, more broadly, or some issues on that, and and I tried to organize this around the question of how to make research results or the the, the knowledge that we produce in like in the research that we are making. So how to make it relevant kind of and heard, which is maybe difficult. I don't know if there's, I assume that many of us are working with qualitative data and, and ethnographic and qualitative data as I am. So first about the concept of affective affinities, which I, I liked a lot and, and, and got really inspired. Although I don't know if I <laughs> understood it correctly, of course. Well, the, but the way I understood it, so I think I, I started to think of of the way how this is as you presented it, Steve. This is a way to to kind of look in the class reproduction, how it occurs, how it's kind of made in everyday encounters and everyday and everyday life, and also how what kind of weird hybrid class relations are made as the Rosie's case. So I think we all recognize kind of the gap between the, the broader structural structural analysis about uh, about like class differences, inequality maybe in the in, 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 in the societies, how we have a we have piles and piles and articles and reports and, and, and TV shows and newspaper articles about about uh, uh, continuous and existing class inequalities, and here in, in the case of Finland, but quite a few, um, quite a little bit of, of explanation how this actually occurs. So it's kind of a black box. Sorry. So it's kind of a, sometimes you feel like it's kind of a black box. Like what's, what, what's, act, what's actually happening, happening uh, in everyday life, in, at homes, schools, wherever, to, to enable, kind of feed into these processes that these inequalities keep existing. So I was thinking that, uh, thinking through this effective, what you call effective affinity, affinities, uh, it's really a kind of showing or a one way to, to provide an explanation 
of the struggles and the, the, the resources and dif differences in resources or the obstacles or the, 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 the and also personal feelings and affects how, how these are played out in the everyday life and how they how different people kind of interact interact with the structures and also like other people in the, the in the in everyday in, in everyday life and everyday interactions. It's kind of providing a our ability to name name a process, give it give it a name when it's and then it's easier maybe to communicate maybe to the wider audience or like in public discussions or in for to, to policy making or whatever, when you, when you can use like words to, to name a process, what happens as, uh, as in Steve's presentation, like it's these various instances, like showing the, showing the resources and, and maybe kind of differences in young, uh, in young people's, how they are kind of pushes and what kind of resources, what kind of uh, strengths and weaknesses they have. I don't know if this is uh, clear, but this is what I, I kind of, this is how I interpreted and started thinking. Also, but also then like not thinking, not individualizing it too much because the, maybe there is a, when communicating research results that show that young, uh, some, uh, some, people might be like have less resources to maybe move into some spaces like higher education. So if you communicate this to the, like the vocabulary of affect, maybe it individualizes it a bit, kind of making it, oh, oh this is just like a scared young person. Why, why, why wouldn't this person just be, you know, strong and, <laughs> and kind of uh, just that you don't, you don't need to, um, need to be kind of scared or pushed back, just do whatever everybody else is doing. So kind of in this way, not individualizing, just because as I understood the affective, like affect theory, it's not uh, like individual, individualized feelings are kind of uh, call, like a collectively produced structures of feeling maybe, or like repertoires of feeling that you may be positioned in, in a different ways. But this is what I was thinking about. Kind of, I'm seeing the very uh, like a way forward to look into these various various uh, uh, inequalities that maybe we see here. Then I started thinking about the, the figures of youth. And you also also use just a, like maybe for for like a cl clarify what we talk about within the youth research community or sociological research community, but I was starting to think in terms of the research that I made uh, in, the, in, in the unemployment services and youth services for like young people outside education and, and, and employment. <laughs> and also, this is also about like how to communicate the complexities of young, young people's everyday lives within this, as a researcher, like within this, this field where I was doing ethnographic research uh, in these services, listening to the workers there, and then also like thinking about the policy context and then listening to the young people. So, uh, and now I'm currently also uh, trying to, in, in similar project, trying to deal with policymakers, <laughs> uh, trying to communicate certain results to policymakers who seem to be unable to grasp that young people, young people's lives are not very stable at all at, at all times. But, but there's always these like mix-ups and, and struggles and, and things happen unexpectedly that young people's lives are not like proceeding in this, in this uh, in the way that is, is visioned in the policy definitions. So anyway, so I was thinking about this this figure, figure of, of like. A bureaucratic figure of youth, maybe youth in, in this, like the period of youth, how it's supposed to proceed in this certain, like very uh, uh, certain steps. So that one step leads to another, and there's no, not much, not much um, 
not much uh, leeway for <laughs> like detours or anything that you need, young people are expected to really sort of proceed. And not like in terms of life course that maybe youth researchers are <laughs> maybe more um, familiar in talking to, but in, in my research projects, it's really uh, like acting correctly in terms of, of, of the administrative, <laughs> administrative, administrative rules and expectations. So, and like that young people are expected to know kind of how to apply for different schools, when to do it, is exactly what are the uh, educational policy expectations, but also what are the expectations of the social policies and, and, and employment policies in terms of their social security, uh, that they need to, uh, need to fulfill some criteria in case that they end up, for example, un unemployed. So they are expected to act, act kind of correctly within the system, system, the social policy system and educational system. And in this context also, like how to communicate research, research results about, <laughs> about like what actually are young people's lives. And I have been surprised by that having to explain like very, things that seem obvious to me, like explaining to a policymaker that have you ever thought that maybe there are some things that happen to people that they might get sick or their families might get sick and they might not know what they want. And, and they also might <laughs> prefer to, prefer to uh, get an education that they, uh, or get into an educational program that they actually are interested in rather than, <laughs> rather than just, uh, taking up any any educational program as expected, kind of fast transition to the, to the post compulsory educational program, for example. So having to explain very, I don't know, like the things that seem very obvious to anybody. So when you deal, when I when I have been dealing with the kind of policy makers and and policy makers, this has been hard to do, like surprisingly hard to to communicate. Uh, in this context, and also I think in in public in public uh, discussions, for example, it's hard to communicate, hard to uh, kind of how would I say that it's hard it's hard to make room for young people's uh, like mistakes and problems and and uh, like the normal use maybe that young people are, are doing uh, in, in the context where, where every, uh, young people are really expected to, to, uh, to fulfill the expectations of various educational policies and also employment policies. I don't know, I, I don't know if, if like you share this, this feeling that communicating certain research results is very Difficult and also communicating like qualitative research results based on qualitative and ethnographic research, which usually uh, is a comp like a, you have to communicate something really complex and, and, and messy, usually. So, this is what I kind of uh, was thinking about. Well, I started to think about like when about during this, when I heard now this presentation. Uh, but I also maybe can it, can move to because I have like a second part about my own research project. Do I have time? What is also okay? Thank you. So, uh, sorry, I think I need my notes. My, I, so because I was I started to think also through. Anyway, I started to think through my. Uh, I can. Oh, never mind. I think I have a like it's open here, so I, don't, I can't open it. Okay. Anyway, so I started thinking through my, uh, through my uh, research project on the. Oh, thanks. Research project on the service young people working in the service sector, uh, in in restaurants, 
uh, in uh, fast food fast food places uh, like kind of a an, not not in a night sign economy or bars like in Steve's project so uh, before but when I started or before we started or particularly my colleague who started kind of pre-COVID I saw the sector kind of as an invisible work it's usually not heard in the I mean nobody discusses it really in the public although it provides a lot of work and it's a growing sector provides a lot of work for a lot of people particularly young people it's not like there's been discussion about care work for example the crisis of care work and, and the working conditions or like IT sector which is supposed to kind of save Finland and provide all kinds of solutions for national economy but I think service sector work is something that is not really discussed but then COVID happened and it sort of brought out that because <laughs> when with the lockdowns and closures uh everybody became aware of that well that there's this huge service sector and now they're all unemployed as in as in steve's presentations as well as well uh so it kind of brought it up to you so that everybody had to kind of <laughs> acknowledge this this sector and then then afterwards what happened when the lock the kind of the lockdowns and closures now that it's covid is kind of not over but but uh getting better uh, all of a sudden it appeared that there's a there's a labor shortage in the sector so people who used to work in this in this in the sector young people maybe or other people as well they didn't go back to them apparently they didn't go back to to their previous jobs when when the restaurants kind of opened again so then maybe started a like a discussion so tell discussion of like how this why why is this happening what's what's going on here well, what's going on here now that people are not getting back I think not getting getting back uh, to work work there and where kind of where they went and what, what what's wrong with the sector that they are not going back. So I'll come to that back to that later. But then to go back our our interviews in in our research projects. So the narratives we heard uh, in in this in our research. So for, first of all. Um, when COVID happened with the like layoffs and large scale unemployment, the people working in the sector made, made, made quick moves for alternative sources of income. Well, they, they, most of them were entitled to social security, either like unemployment benefits or other, but they, other like benefits, but they, they also made other moves. They moved houses, like in Steve's example as well, uh, they like moved into with their with their friends or with their back to their parents' houses and or or, or then get got another job, like very very quickly. Sort of made very quick decisions to I need more money now. I need to get another job and, and kind of were very flexible. I, I I was thinking it in terms of like they were very um like fit to our society's expectations as they were kind of flexible citizens that kind of quickly found something else and then were able to support themselves selves again. But then also what we heard about the, the work in the, in the sector, uh, the work is, is hectic, it's very intense uh, and, and uh, physically demanding and requires that you deal with difficult customers and solve problems, like solve problems that kind of come up very quickly. But this, because it just like, just because of this very hectic nature, the, the workers enjoy it uh, really much. They, they get satisfaction, they get like rewards out of being able to manage this like horrible work load and work work situation so it provide, provides joy and and like satisfaction and feel like feelings of competence you're you kind of and feelings of being like a professional in your field like i am able to uh, like it, it, it might not be like you're ed, you have an education in this or, or education but then you kind of you're kind of a professional working in this sector and you're able to deal with the Kind of what it, what what sounded like a horrible, horrible, um, horrible working conditions. So so kind of being proud of what they're doing, proud of their work, and what proud of what they've achieved in this sector. You know, positive narrative. So very very positive, very effective. Also in a sense that they describe how they are, how they like their jobs, and how it, it's they enjoy it, and how they enjoy the large crowds and. And, and lots of people, lots of clients. But at the same time, the, the work is precarious. It's precarious in terms of work contracts, which is, it's, it's it, it, like Finnish working life is not precarious in the sense that maybe in other countries, 
it's relatively standard based on like standard contracts, standard work contracts. But this is a sector that is based on zero hour contracts, temporary contracts, agency work, and, and, and very little pay also. And also the workforce is really diverse. The students, they're people who kind of work there for the careers and they're foreigners, they're foreign students, this is the presentation. So, and this, this all this like, com and in combination, this like posit very positive attitude and enjoying being able to deal with the, deal with the like hectic, hectic work environments and massive amounts of work uh, with this kind of non-standard conditions uh that so that you might change jobs really quick, quickly they're not really work community like long-term work communities in workplaces uh, uh create a situation when they're easily exploitable because there's no like collective organization around the work because it's kind of a you know i'm not i'm not going to be working here for a long time and and i'm changing I'm, I'm kind of solving the problems on my own like i don't need any collective organization and then also we heard like stories of kind of straight exploit exploitation. They were like exhaustion, stress, burnout. It's physically really demanding. Everybody's telling us that, that, that we don't, you don't see anybody over the age of 35 here because, because you can't survive, kind of you can't survive, survive this work here. It's too demanding. It's physically too demanding. And it, it sort of wears you out and you will get all sorts of uh, physical injuries and, 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 and this kind of this way. So this made me, then at this point, when we had the research results and, and kind of this COVID uh, labor shortage emerged, at this point, I don't know, maybe you remember now this fall, a few months ago, uh, then a small scale youth political mobilization happened, I don't know, but this was in Yodel. Uh, in terms of, uh, and in, related to the, one of the large fast food uh, chains in Finland. So the workers of the chain came out, came kind of came out and started posting in Yodel, which is an anonymous, uh, I don't know, social media thing about the horrific working conditions in this like respectable Finnish company. <laughs> so this is not, this is the company is not the shady small company working in the like, uh, I know margins of the economy, but the respectable family owned Finnish companies. So they started posting that we, our working conditions are horrible. There's always uh, staff shortages and we are burned out and we, and, and, and we can't go to the bathroom because there's no time, can't take any breaks. We work uh, too long hours and, and kind, of, uh, kind of made this visit, made the working conditions uh, of the restaurant sector visible in a way that it hasn't been, it hadn't been done at least you know, for a while, kind of proving also what we, we had just found, <laughs> found in our, our research. So this might be then think, uh, like, how is this possible? How is this possible that we did not know? <laughs> or at least I don't think that many people kind of know. I don't, how is it possible that as sociologists, we didn't, <laughs> we didn't kind of pay attention? Or at least if we knew, did not consider this something that we do, would do research on or something. And this uh, then made me think of the figures of youth, kind of what Steve was talking about. So trying to, to connect this somehow. So I th I, then I started thinking that all my argument, all my you know, vague idea now, <laughs> now is that like in a Finnish society, particularly, the, the figure of youth as a, like a student, as somebody who needs to get a, a, a post-compulsory education, either vocational or university education, is very strong. There's a lot of investment in and public discussion around this need to that everybody needs to get an education, and then we will, <laughs> young people will eventually save. Finnish national economies and saved our societies and blah, 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 everything. So I think this we kind of lost sight of the actual work that young people are doing currently, and which also failed us kind of protect them or the, while, at, while they're working, which is maybe like a failure from researchers, researchers and also for maybe for unions. unions. So like at the same time, when the whole hospitality sector is dependent on these young people working there. It, I don't think it wouldn't exist 
without young people working there, or at least, well, because we see it now, because the young people, they got out, and they, now they're doing something else, and they, they, there's this labor shortage system, and maybe it kind of made, uh, made it evident that there are other jobs with better pay and better working conditions available also. But at the same time, kind of, uh, there's a lot of work that young people are doing while we kind of don't recognize it. And this sector is dependent on the work. It's dependent on the, like the, the labor power, but it's, it's, it's also dependent on them being young people. It's not in a sense, like, like Steve was also talking about that youthfulness is as a, as an, it's an asset. It's something that a value is made out in the nighttime economy, uh, but maybe like as a, something by vibrant than being like a, a young person who's able to manage like clients in Barcelona. But the, here also uh, in, or oh, how I interpreted our interviews that they, they're dependent on them young and like able to work long hours and, and able to, to, to kind of hold the physical demands and the stress, like when you get older, you're not just not able to work that fast, <laughs> work, work that much and you kind of feel it in your body. So they need their bodies kind of, they're, they're able and young and, and not tired bodies uh, to, to kind of, to run the economy, run the business the way that they're doing it, doing it now, now. So this is, was, this was kind of on, uh, train of thought that I, that I had like, and also uh, also in a sense that what we like uh, these figures of you, what we think about young people when we, how we think they are and, and what kind of, what we think they're engaged in, whether it's studies or political activities or, or now that now it's work. I mean, that we don't lose sight of some aspects of young people's lives when we kind of focus on some other aspects as researchers, I mean here, aspects of young people's lives. Okay, I will stop here. <laughs> so thank you, Lotta. And thank you also, Stephen, once again, for very inspiring talks. Can you hear me? Good. Uh, yes. Yes, I, I'm sure there are now some questions or comments from the audience. Uh, so uh, I now give floor to the audience to, to comment what you have heard. And maybe we also have something in the chat. Uh, so if, we, if, if you want to, you there who are online, I, I see there are 45 participants online. So if you have some comments, you can just uh, write uh, to the chat or, or raise your hand or what, how, how you would like to comment. Um, but now I open the floor to you. If you have some questions or comments. I You, you are now, now. thinking. Uh, so um, maybe I can just start uh, and then you can think of your comments. Um, I think this was so inspiring and so, so rich uh, what you were talking about and, and the, uh, uh, the, um, Steve's uh, talk and, and Ota's comments were really nicely work together. Um, I think in the beginning of your talk, you Steve talked about um, the how the symbolic violence can be experienced as effective violence. So um, it was an interesting thought and, and I was thinking whether you can somehow elaborate on this, what is the relationship between symbolic violence and, and effective violence in your studies, how you have um, conceptualized or understood this relationship? Yeah, th thanks for that question. It's, it's a good one. I mean, um, 
and, it, and it's kind of the underlying, I suppose, uh, motivation for that uh, theoretical work that I did there. So, I mean, I, I've always really liked the idea of symbolic violence. I think it um, allows us to understand how power works in particular situations. Um, and while I am kind of familiar with the phenomenological symbolic idea that it kind of is driven by, I suppose, I think, thinking about, you know, someone being hurt by a teacher's comment as symbolic, to me, kind of underplays what's happening in that moment. It's, it's not symbolic, right? It's emotional. It's, you know, someone's being, you know, insulted or whatever. So um, I, I suppose that's, that's a kind of, it's, it's, it's more a descriptive move than a theoretical one in many ways. I, I, I just could, would like to see the, the relational, situational things that happen in that moment emphasised. It doesn't seem to me that that's symbolic. It, 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 symbolic kind of, to me, almost makes it less real or something. Um, so it's, it's kind of a, a descriptive move, move as much as a um, conceptual one to to emphasize how those feelings are really important. Like they're the things that mark us, that influence how we develop as a person from an early age, you know, and then um, I suppose make up our dispositions in terms of, you know, how we are oriented towards different things and make decisions and things like that. So by moving from the symbolic toward the effect there, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, emphasize the importance of those things, I think. Um, as much as kind of making some kind of fancy new concept or anything, it's more like what I'm trying to describe, I suppose, in that research. Mm, yeah. Does that make sense? Yes, I, yes, it does. Thank you for the clarification. I mean, can I say, like, and to link it back to the figures, the, the example that Lotta used earlier on with, about the, the, um, the figure of a young person in a policy document, as opposed to, you know, the figure in our research that we see is a perfect example of, what I want to do with that work of figures. But it's also a really good example of how symbolic violence works, right? That's that disjuncture between the young person that's like this rational trajectory straight line in a policy document to really the messiness of young people's lives. You know, that, that kind of brings that stuff together. There's two different figures being used there. And what results is that there's a kind of distance between the um, I suppose the possibility of that policy being successful because it doesn't actually reflect real people's lives. So there's both a figurative difference going on there, and that will result in all these kinds, of, I think, forms of symbolic and what I call effective violence. So I think that that example, like between the young person in the policy document and the everyday kind of life young person, is an excellent example of what I've been going on about, I think. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Now, have you thought what you would like to ask? Yes, Daria. Okay. Um, uh, I would, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. I'm Daria Tolan, and I would like to ask. Uh, I was wondering. I really like the previous question about symbolic violence and, and affections. And I was wondering, like uh, Bourdieu has this, um, this kind of a economic and uh, cultural and social uh, capitals. And how can you kind of a mix these into this, your analysis? You, they were there in, the, in one sense, yeah. but if you yeah. want to say something more about it. And also um, I was wondering, because. Beverly Skex also talks about these things and about how, how value is generated and like middle class people would see themselves more kind of a valuable or, or can see in them more certain value more easily and, and, and also that affects how people are like talked about in the um, in the um, uh, 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 popular culture like you were just say, giving us examples. So there's yes. a lot of things I'm really interested <laughs> in and I really loved your talk. But well, if you want to elaborate. Yeah, like thanks so much. Um, so I'm, 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 I'm hugely influenced by Beverly Skeggs. I think her work is just incredible. So, um, and, you know, 
my work is probably as influenced by Beverly Skeggs as it is Bourdieu these days. I think her work's incredible. So like, I, I've kind of taken some some of those developments that Skeggs has done, I think, on Bourdieu and definitely brought into my own work. And it's definitely very, very influential on um, the Bourdieu and Effect book. Um, so um, when it comes to cultural capital, so I, I, I kind of write a chapter in the book about the effective elements of cultural capital. And I mean, so if we, if we break it down into what Bourdieu defines as institutionalized, um, I always forget the three. So it's institutionalized, embodied and objective forms of capital. I mean, the embodied form of cultural capital is almost exclusively effective. You know, it's the way we use language and the way that therefore someone interprets who we are and our status or whether we're like, you know, a good student or not. The, uh, the way we hold ourselves, the way we dress, that kind of, so that, that's particularly, I think, open to kind of a more, um, thinking about effect in that sense, but even the other forms of cap cultural capital um, have what I what I call in that book effective elements. So objectified cultural capital, you know, while it might be about things in your house or, or whatever, you know, Bourdieu talks about you know artworks and musical instruments and that kind of stuff. Maybe today we can talk about computers or, or whatever. Um, those objects don't just exist, and the ownership of them just doesn't confer kind of you know, advantage, those objects have effects. Um, so, so the example I use in the book is that um, when, when a student, like if, if a student comes into my office or, you know, I've got all the expert books here behind me, right? These books here now confirm me as an expert, right? If I had the screen turned around, you'd see a really messy room over here. I mean, so the books have this object, these things, and they have all this knowledge in them, but they also convey these kind of effective, elements so if a student comes into my office and sees all the books they might feel a little bit intimidated or they might feel inspired depending on their own background um, when my friends from my working class background come into my house and see all the all the books they call me a tosser and a wanker right they they they're very different objects to different people so that's the kind of relational elements that I try to bring out in in the, in the kind of bringing a you know more emphasis on effect to to these concepts. Um, and I think then if you think about the, the way that embodied capital and objectified capital leads to various institutionalized forms of capital, you know, the, the Oxford or Cambridge or Harvard degree has very different effects to when someone reads it on the resume than my UK, University of Newcastle one, right? The person doing the job will be affected by that in a way that's, you know, very different. So I suppose that's the kind of emphasis in description, I suppose, <clears throat> that I'm trying to draw out by um, emphasizing those effective elements. Thanks. Um, I can see in chat, there are some comments, but uh, they are um, thanking both of you for your talks and they have been really inspiring, but I can't see any particular question question there or if you Stephen can see there yourself something that you would like to comment yep I'll just have to read them hang on a sec <laughs> yeah yeah meanwhile if you wish to comment from the audience you're welcome I'll definitely check out the obedience in labor market um thing to suggest that I have to write that now yeah, I think it was also interesting what you both were talking about the responsibility of youth researchers uh, uh, towards society and Lotta was talking about the difficulties in bringing out the knowledge that comes out from the research which is often quite complex whereas the decision makers would like to see something simple straightforward uh, solutions to problems um, I, I found it really interesting and it, it's really to the point, it's really difficult to communicate the, the um, complexities of young people's lives in yeah. this context. But how do you think, Stephen, yourself, have you been engaged in these kinds of discussions and what are oh, your actually, experiences? That's a, that's a really great question. I mean, so I, I've gone through stages with this, I must say, and I feel a little bit hypocritical sometimes. Um, so. When I first started as a researcher, I was very much like, we need to do pure research and like, 
the public sphere can look after itself. And like anytime you talk to the media, whatever you say gets distorted and blah, blah, blah. Um, more recently, and maybe this also reflects the pressures of the job in a way that we're encouraged to do this more, but like, I'm starting to think that that's a mistake. And, you know, just talking to policy people or whatever is a mistake. We should maybe be, be in the public more. And it's particularly because, uh, and, but, but even doing media more, I worry then you're just kind of part of the incessant kind of babble or whatever that there's no real meaning. But like our, the expertise in Australia is dominated by psychologists and economists. Um, and I think they have very distorted views in, of the world um, and promote you know, certainly an evolutionary psychology and a kind of very neoliberal form of economy is, the, is what dominates our airwaves when any expert is asked to talk about anything. So maybe it is important for sociologists to bring um, their knowledge into that public sphere more. It's not easy. Um, and I don't think many media outlets actually want to talk to us because we complexify and make difficult many of the things that they do. It's also really like I'm not a particularly outgoing person. So it's, it's a really anxious thing to do as well. So I've been doing a little bit of it recently and it um, takes up a lot of mental energy for me. But um, I think it is important that we actually start getting more involved in those conversations. Again, I'm not familiar of the public discourse in, in Finland, but yeah, in, in Australia in particular, it tends to be, you know, if, if there is actual an expert talking about something, often someone just talking about a topic they know nothing about, but if it, if it is an expert talking in the media or whatever, it tends to be dominated by psych and economistic um, points of view, so. Yeah, but I do worry like about, you know, the, the, even the effectiveness of, you know, you know, filter bubbles and all the kind of work that goes on around that kind of stuff today, and how much impact we can make, but I think it wouldn't hurt to try. Thanks. Yes, Lotta would yeah, like to Yeah, comment. I can comment on this, like further comment on this. Uh, I agree, it's, it's the same in, in, Finnish, in, in Finland as well, the economists and well, psychology also, they dominate all <laughs> like it's it's not only the like discussions of young people but like all all fields in the public discussion and and i think that sociologists or or like social sciences or humanities they should bring more or their views or make they make make them the, make their views heard but it seems to be very very difficult i was also thinking when i was like listening to the talk uh, of these affective affinities, uh, I don't thinking about them. I don't know if you have also noticed that not it, there seems to be a lot of like brain research based on brain scans, so MRIs and mm -hmm. So also in relation to kind of poverty. So I, I have noticed that people seem to <laughs> seem to. Uh, be more convinced if you show like a brain scan that poverty makes you depressed. <laughs> it's very yeah. demanding and a kind of a kind of uh, uh, causes your brain brain to do like function not properly than providing an ethnographic uh, sociological description of the difficulties that poverty or yeah. living in a poverty, uh, being a child living in a in, in poor families or like otherwise vulnerable families or the co co providing ethnographic kind of thick accounts of effective yeah. uh, scars or whatever. But I, 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 it's just something that I've noticed. I don't, maybe that's <laughs> there's something that we want to believe in the, in like physical, I mean, like we are there, like what I like, like science is not social science. Uh, yeah. So it makes it even more difficult. It's not like fighting economists, it's fighting <laughs> brain scans. <laughs> yeah, so psychology's managed to make itself like into a, like a hard science or medicalized yeah. Um, yeah. expertise when it's a foundationally social science. And as we know about the crisis of replication that's going on in that discipline, I mean, there's a, there's a you know, we could really question a lot of stuff that's going on, but they have managed to associate themselves as almost like a medicine, which seems to have more legitimacy. And that's a problem for us as social scientists in a way. And definitely what you're saying there in terms of representation of things simplistically seems to have more play in the media. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a problem, problem for sure. Mm.
And social sciences, we don't have replication crisis. All our results are always the same. <laughs> like, <laughs> always. like, I don't have anything new. It's the same. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can see some comments here on in the chat section. Um, hints yeah, I mean, that's, 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 that's for some reason is seen as objective objective knowledge where we all know like how much data is cleaned and like all this kind of stuff that happens with statistics. I mean, so, you know, maybe, maybe we need to um, embark on some kind of qualitative research education program or something, but um, yeah. yeah. And now I don't want to downplay that or anything for stats and it's really important, but like it does again, seem to numbers seem to matter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one point thing is still is this that we should what you Stephen mentioned in your talk that we should also be some or at least I got understood that we need to be reflexive on what do we represent ourselves what kind of uh, figures of views we are reproducing so yeah it's it's our responsibility as well to mm. think even though it is a complex issue when we engage in, in the public debates and uh, so what kind of a youth weaker figure is appearing in those discussions but um, yes yeah yeah the young person like with the brain scan stuff the kind of young person represented as like a brain in the jar i think um there's a, there's a paper called uh, something like that that i think is critical of that point of view i think that's really important to critique yes Yes, I was just saying that there are some comments in the chat. Um, um, compliments and, and uh, hints of books and uh, uh, info about book launch from yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> so you can read it from there. But um, do we still have some, some comments or? Yes, Henry, please. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Henry Alamberan. I would like to, I would like to <clears throat> raise a kind of a quite maybe a specific question. I'm not sure if I can phrase it <laughs> properly, but I will try. Um, I'm very interested in the notion of illusion that you mentioned, Stephen, in your work in terms of the bar workers and also in the in the for one of the first slides in terms of concepts that you use. Um, if taking that theme on one hand and then, then on the other hand, the kind of um, <clears throat> call that Anne Phoenix raised yesterday uh, for the kind of more relational approaches to, to studying young people uh, as opposed to kind of individualized um, narratives or experiences. Um, I would be very interested to hear what's your take on the kind of, um, how do you say, how would I say, um, the kind of shared making of illusion among the bar workers or among the young people working in the, in the hamburger, hamburger joints, how do they kind of collectively, how do you say, perhaps cultivate or discuss or negotiate if they try to do this kind of work in the in the practice of of the working life. Do you, you want me to go first? There. Yeah. yeah. Did yeah. you hear the question? Yes, I did. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great, great. Yeah, <laughs> okay. I think it was. For you. Okay. I was worried. Um, no, it's great. It's a great question. Um. So. Okay. It, so I, I I think Elysio is a particularly interesting concept because it do, it does a lot of work in a way in Bourdieu, but it's not mentioned very much. It, it's kind of a concept to think about how meaning is made. So illusio is not an illusion. It's, it's, a, it's a way that, of investing in various meanings and make them worthwhile in our life. I mean, if we don't socially construct meaning, our lives are meaningless and there's a whole existential vacuum kind of thing. So it's like engaging with that kind of Nietzschean stuff and, and, and Sartrean stuff there. So illusio I find really interesting because it speaks to our aspirations and how we're motivated to do things and how once we invest ourselves into things, they become more important. They, they, they gather what Bourdieu calls social gravity. 
gravity in the sense that we're attracted to them in that magnet magnetic way, but gravity in the sense they become more important to us. We we feel you know they're important. So an example there, if you invest yourself in the illusio of higher education and you invest you know four years into it or whatever, and then come out the end of it and you can't really get a job, you, you know there's going there's fundamental symbolic violence going on there because the investment hasn't paid off. In terms of the collective stuff, there's a couple of passages in Bourdieu that where he talks about what he calls a collusio, um, like a, where he's kind of bringing together illusio and collusion there. And he argues that what happens in particular fields is that as people work together and create meaning or create you know, common sense or whatever, there's a shared kind of, um, I suppose, need for those people, for that, those interests to remain They've invested in it. They've they've got you know put a bunch of time into it. So it's to their advantage if they kind of collude, not necessarily in a conspiracy, but like to keep those kind of things going. So whether that's you know I don't know if I can kind of quickly make an example up, but like I don't know economists seeing neoliberal economics remain dominant in society, right? Even though sustainable economics is needed or something, there's a collusio going on there in the battle to see what knowledge is um, that dominates. In the in the more kind of everyday empirical sense in the bar work. Um, the, the bar workers, for instance, talk about different reasons for doing it. Obviously, you know, if they're students, they need to eat and pay rent and that, but like getting a job in a bar is a kind of fun job mostly, even though as a lot of pointed out, there's some kind of backbreaking work involved in it as well. And like, um, there's a lot of crossover in what she was talking about in our work, you know, having to drink and, you know, you know picking up kegs and all kinds of stuff. But there's a kind of, other thing that we're kind of really interested in that research in terms of Illusio is that one of the purposes of working in a bar is to create a vibe. Um, and, our, and, our, and our respondents talk about this all the time. They know that's part of their job, um, to be happy, to um, be convivial. Um, and when that's going and working, and again, like I think Lotta was talking about this as well, the fun happens and they, and they talk about flow. Like, so they can be what they call getting smashed by, you know, people that bars tend deep, but everything's going well. And like people's bodies are moving around without kind of knocking into each other. Everything feels good. Um, there's no spillage. They're getting beers out quickly. Like um, there's, and then this kind of investment in that shared vibe becomes a form of pleasure that they, they experience in that kind of social scene. So again, I think the concept of Luzio is doing a lot of work there and kind of have to break it up a little bit, but like, the, the shared experience of investing in something and having it go well um, is really pleasurable in even in a kind of what is a particularly kind of heavy labor, you know, busy, stressful situation. I don't know, did that address the what you were asking? Yeah. Thanks, Stephen. Are you happy, Henry? <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you so much. I think, um, I can't see any more comments or questions. So I think uh, we could thank once again, uh, Stephen and Lotta for their excellent speeches. And, uh, uh, become, uh, and we will close this session, um, but I think I should remind you that uh, we have now a lunch break and then at 12, I'm not sure if I'm right. We will have the working groups. And then uh, in the end, uh, um, 2.30, we will have coffee at Metsetalo. So please come there as well to have some coffee. And uh, thank you for all for coming and, and commenting and, and making this a great session. Thank you. Th thanks everybody. I really want to thank everyone for coming and thanks so much for Lotto and the organizers. I really appreciate it. Thanks very much. Thank you, Steve. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.